So, hello. I'm recording now, but first I would like to thank you. Thank you very much for letting us come to your house today. It's a great honor. I knew you through Facebook, but to be face to face is very different. So, thank you very much. You're welcome. I am just proud and honored that you are doing this for the veterans across the country. I, I'm pleased that I can tell my story around throughout Europe, throughout the country here, and I've had so many people ask me to come and talk to them. And uh, there's a lot of veterans that won't say a word about what they did and why they did it, you know. But I'm happy to talk. Maybe sometime they, people might get tired of you talking to them about it, but they seem to enjoy it, so as long as I'm a fit to do it, I'm going to do it. That's perfect for the next generation. Right. We need to know more. Right. So, Harold, where you were born and when? Okay. I was born in Elmore City, Oklahoma, on July the 17th, 1924. I am 91 years old as of this year, and not far from 92, but uh, I am really uh, in pretty good shape. I get out and walk every morning, and over the years I've walked a many a mile. In fact, a lady asked me here about a couple of years ago, she said, Mr. Bradley says, how many miles have you walked? since you retired. I had never given it a thought, you know. I just, I knew I, I did it regularly every day. At that time, I was walking around five miles a day, five days a week, permitting the weather was fit to walk in. So I come home at night and I got me a computer. I started averaging up five days a week, four weeks in a month. And before I totaled it up, I says, holy mackerel, I had walked over 19,000 miles. So I'm still moving. And the doctor says, that's why I'm st still moving, is because you've, you walked and walked and walked. I said, well, any time that keeps me out of the hospital, I'm, I'm happy for that. <laughs> that's something. So you could have, like, yeah, walk all around the world like a few times. That's right. Wow. Mm -hmm. That's something. Yeah. And, oh, I just forgot one thing, I'm sorry. You told us that you were born in Oklahoma and mm -hmm. a farmer boy, you told us. So I guess your parent, your father was a farmer? That's right. My father was a farmer. And in our family, we had uh, three boys and a girl. I was the oldest of the, of the family, and my sister was the youngest of the family. And I went to school. I worked out there on the farm till 1942. And by then, I graduated from high school in 1942. And in July, that was in May, I graduated. And in July, I became 18 years of age and had to register for the draft. Well, I was still working out there on the farm, cutting broom corn. Can you imagine what broom corn is? Thank you, but brooms. And I was working for 15 cents an hour. Work eight and 10 hours a day for a dollar and a half. You told me 18 hours a day? No, I uh, worked eight to ten hours a day. Oh, okay, because 18 is... Yeah, and then for 15 cents an hour, that would only be a dollar and a half if I worked ten hours, you know. Yeah. And, uh, but anyway, I I enjoyed the farm life, but I never dreamed that once I left the farm that I might ever go back. But then my brother, he would volunteered for the uh, 101st Airborne Division, 
and therefore dad lost two two uh, employees on the farm for the army in the air force air uh, airborne and uh but he never tried to get either one of us uh where we could stay on the farm i know there's a lot did but we didn't he didn't do it he worked the best he could and uh so after I registered for the draft, I left the farm and went to work uh, for a five and dime cent warehouse, which uh, they eventually wound up selling out in their uh, later years. But anyway, uh, I worked there until Uncle Sam called me and in nineteen. 43, February of 43, Uncle Sam called me and I was drafted into the Army and inducted in February, February 43. I'm just going to back up a little bit. Okay. Because uh, I'm sure you get a lot of stories about that, but when you were younger, uh, you told us that you grew up in the farm and so. Did you go to school because you were going to school to be graduated? Yep. So how did you do during the week? You couldn't like work eight hours a day? Well, uh, most of the time, uh, the farm work that I was involved in was during the summer months, you know, when the production of it started coming in in, in, uh, in the summer. And uh, um, so we worked a lot uh, on the farm. My dad put me and my brother in the, the broom corn field when we were small. And but he told the owner of that crop, the farmers they'd all gather together. They'd work each other's field together, you know, to uh, help uh, out. So he put us on one side of that broom corn row and told the owners. He said, "Now they're not old enough to make a hand," but he says. I will keep them caught up with the rest of the people working. They won't fall behind. If they do, I'll get on the other side and cut them up. And he did that for every year until we got old enough to make a, a hand ourselves. And uh, so it was, it was a challenging all all along to. Uh, and he taught us how to do this and how to do that on the farm, as long before we was ever able to make a hand. And so that's that's one another reason. I, I, when I said that I didn't really think I'd go back to the farm, but I eventually did after the war. And when Dad passed away, I went back to the farm to help my mother out. She never learned to drive a car or nothing, and that boy that made it hard because she had to rely on somebody else to help her out. And uh, brothers and sisters all lived way a long way from home. So it wound up for me to do the job. Harold, I was wondering, uh, you know, at that time, because now it's very different, you know, we've got Facebook, we've got phone, we've got computer, so we can be informed about anything around the world in two minutes. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering in Oklahoma as a farmer boy, how was, I mean, how did you see the world, and how did you see your country? Did you, I mean, did you travel sometimes? I know that was not mm. usual to mm. travel. But could you go out of the states? Did you know what happened? What was happening in the other states? Or could you tell me more about the communication at that time? Well, the only communication we had is by mouth to mouth with, through the neighborhood. Until I got into school, you know, and I would be talking to other people around there, but. Uh, as far as communications, we didn't have it until we got, finally got this, got the old telephone, the ring up type. You had to ring it up, but it was on a party line, and you never know if you picked up the phone to call maybe your neighbor, who else on that line would be on the line. You'd have to wait till they got through, because they would get a little mad when you <laughs> butted in on their conversation, you know. But that was the only community. Well, we did have radio, battery radio, that we could listen to the Grand Ole Opry or something like that from Nashville, Tennessee. But other than that, we didn't have no communication. You couldn't talk to that. 
and uh, the newspaper, we did get a newspaper, but it, it was uh, maybe two or three days old before we got it out to that out to the farm, you know. But otherwise, uh, our communication was very, very light, where we had no, couldn't talk to anybody other than their families, and I guess that was a good deal because the families that lived in the area where we farmed were all relatives practically. Up and down the road, they was uh, all related to one another, uh, family-wise, and uh, we'd all get together. Maybe my mother, and daddy, and somebody else, her sister and their sister's husband, and just uh, get together, visit on on a Sunday or a Saturday afternoon, and just sit there and chat for God knows when or where. But anyway, that's uh, that's about the only as far as getting out of a farm. Maybe once a week, Dad would hook up the old mules, and we would travel by wagon into a little town where I was born, Elmore City, uh, to buy a few groceries. Most of the stuff that we ate on the farm, we grew vegetables of all kinds out there and we raised our own pork. We never killed a cow. We milked the cows for our milk and butter. And, uh, but uh, when uh, we come along later in life, we started be, uh, getting a few things here and a few things there, but uh, most of our stuff that we bought was just very staple stuff, like maybe sugar, flour, and uh, cornmeal. Sometimes we'd grind our own corn to make our own meal. And when the depression came, this was a, a drastic thing for any farmer to have to go through because the wind and the dirt would blow and blow and blow. No rain to mount to anything at all. And we had to get out there and scratch with a what we called a, a har, had tooth, long tooth in it, and scratch the top of this dirt to keep it from blowing away, to have enough soil left if it ever stopped blowing like that. And uh, this was, boy, they call it the Dust Bowl days, and it was flat dust in the air practically day and night. And uh, this was a lot of, lot of people in Oklahoma packed up and moved to California. Just took their wagons and took off for California to get out of the Dust Bowl days. And eventually they came back years later, but. I heard about that, that there were a lot of people from, you know, Oklahoma and the area who just moved to the West because they were, I mean, there were no rain, the weather was mm, very bad, and right. there were no way to have any production. That's right. Mm -hmm. yeah. But your family decided to stay. Yeah. And how did you go through all of those problems? I mean, well, as uh, we just uh, hung together, the family did, and, and uh, we never gone, we never gone, uh, gone hungry. We never did have the the finest of lives. But the love of our family, I guess, it, it, it stuck with us uh, all the way through. And uh, we came out on top the best we could. And uh, my old granddaddy, I'll tell you, I don't know, he was, he was quite a traitor. And he could make a deal with somebody with a shake of his hand and never draw up a contract. He, he trusted them and they trusted him. And at one time, I don't know, he must have... He must have owned uh, a couple of thousand acres of land out there. And uh, before he died, he he could buy a, a land out there for a dollar an acre. And he made it work for him. And uh, at that time, there was no thoughts of oil on the property. and uh, But they would they'd make a deal, and he'd buy it that way. And then uh, at, 
before he passed away, he decided that uh, he'd give each one of his kids 500 acres, no, not 500, 100 acres or more for 500 bucks, which that was a bargain for them, too. And they all hang, they all kept those, that farm for years and years and come out smelling like a rose, I guess you might say. <laughs> but anyway, they all raised their families right out there on the farm, just like we did. Do you still family there? Beg pardon? Do you still family there? Uh, most of the families are all gone today. Mm -hmm. Now the farm that we had, uh, my dad had, was, was a 200 acres farm. And uh, we, uh, we raised corn, we raised oats, we raised wheat, and uh, kaffir corn, that's a, kind of different for chicken feed, you know. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but anyway, uh, we were real uh, lucky to get what we did out of it. Now, I, I had to sell it, I didn't want to, but I had to sell it because my mother got down to the point where I had to put it in a nursing home. And uh, of course, I had to break the news to her and she didn't want to do it. I said, well, they'll take it from us, mother. If you don't want to sell it and get what we can out of it, the government will take it from us because they'll have to put you in there where the government will take care of you and they're going to use the farm to take care of you. So I finally talked to her in the ocean. We sold the farm out there, but a lot less than what it was worth. But back then, that was in late 70s. And uh, so, uh, but anyway, we made it. She used to live long enough to use her portion of it till she passed away. And uh, so after selling a farm like that, I just, I qu have to quit going out to the farm and take care of her. And I was back out there raising a big, big garden, you know, every year by a golly, and raised a few cows and stuff like that by myself. And and till she got to the point where she couldn't stay out there, and then I had to take it, put her someplace. But anyway, I'm happy that I pleased her and made a good living for us all. Uh, you told us that you had a radio, battery radio, mm -hmm. and I was wondering if it's um, the way you you learn about the um, attack on Pearl Harbor on December 7, 1941. Okay. Uh, as I say, I was still <laughs> in school, and my sister and uh, two of my cousins and another lady that they all knew formed what they called themselves, a four-note quartet. And uh, they had gone to Dallas to a convention, what they call a music convention deal. But anyway, uh, I was, uh, we heard it over this radio deal about the bombing of Pearl Harbor. And uh, that was the first time I'd heard anything about it. And uh, so my sister and them was coming back and they had it uh, on their little car radio. And as if they heard that and boy, they was, they said, what's going on in this world? Of course, then they didn't have no idea what would take place at that there, but boy, it stirred up things quite a bit right then. And then I began to wonder whether I would ever be able to finish high school before they might either uh, enlist voluntarily or sweat it out, which I, uh, all, I agreed to stay put in school and get, get, and did graduate from high school in 45, 44, uh, 45, 42. And, uh, but anyway, uh, I had a cousin, he tried to get me to leave school and enlist in the Coast Guard. He was, he had, he was a senior in high school. I said, no, I think I'm just going to sweat it out. So it, I did. I stayed there until, but after the Pearl Harbor deal, it, uh, we had a lot of young men in our class that enlisted in different parts of the service. And, but uh, I got out, got out of school before I got called. 
You knew that one day or another you would be called. That's so right. I knew. Be better it to, just, just didn't have any idea when, but I knew it was going to do something with it. Yeah, it was smart. Yep. To have the education. But you know, uh, that was, see, our tank battalion, maybe get ahead of what you want, but was uh, made up of Oklahoma and Texas boys. Nobody else except the ones that came to train us at uh, Fort, Con Fort Knox. We had no idea that uh, we'd all wind up together like that. So when you were called, you had no choice. You couldn't choose your, like, your branch. Well, you know, that's, that's funny because when we got called and we were sent down to Fort Seal, Oklahoma, and they was trying to place us this, that, and the other, you know. And uh, they, we were sitting there and all give us, they was giving us a test to see supposedly what we might be qualified in. I was sitting right side by side with a couple of my senior friends that graduated the same time I did. And we all more or less copied off the papers. I had two of them by guys go to the Air Force and I got called for the tanks. Now, does that make sense? <laughs> but that's the way they took it. But anyway, uh, we wound up uh, in the, I wound up in the tank battalion at Fort Knox. And uh, gosh, I had no idea what, the, what we were facing or nothing at that time, but <coughs> I didn't have no choice. They said, we want you and you go there. And that's what we did. Because, you know, uh, I've, I've read the, the document you have sent me a few months ago. Yeah. And I remember you were talking about a special training for a special operation. Mm. But the operation, you didn't know what it was and you never knew because it didn't happen. I mean, maybe it happened, but you were not involved in it. So could you tell me more about that specific training in the in the well desert? you know that after we were in uh, Fort Knox at basic training and uh, I uh, I realized this but we were training ahead of time here um, getting a little ahead but anyway we were training in basic training I was in a tank up in a tank commander's place and uh, we were driving learning to drive these tanks the tank went up on a kind of a slope inside slipped off the side and I had my hand resting right under that half moon hatch t the latch wasn't latched or it came loose as it went up on the side and I caught my hand compound fracture right there that finger there pulled the cast it put it in the cast wrapped it clear to my elbow well it was talking about uh, everybody getting the vac uh, furlough before uh, anything else happened he said, Bradley, he says, when that came out, my hands were so stiff I couldn't even move them. So I had to, he says, until you can get where you can move those fingers, you won't get no furrow. Well, that made me work twice as hard. I put my hand in hot Epsom salts, water two and three times a day and worked them. I got them open, I got my furrow. But when there was rumors going on at that time, that we were going to be put into some kind of special project, but nobody would give you a word mm -hmm. until we got back off of furloughs. Then they announced that we were going to be put in this special project, and we were going to be out here in a certain area that was going to be secret. Nobody was to leave the camp at any time. If you got sick or got hurt, you would not leave the camp because they're afraid that you would mention what they had already told you about it. Yeah. But anyway, we signed our name on the dotted line that we would not divulge it. And then we got orders that we would be sent to the Arizona desert. We got out there in the Arizona desert, but we were delayed two or three times because of... Uh, trains that didn't get there in time and we didn't do this and didn't do that but anyway we finally wound up out in the Arizona desert in October <coughs> of 43 
and we started training out there. And we nobody would be was allowed to leave the base without three to four people in that same group. Our mail was censored. If we wrote something on the mail to our family, they'd cut it out. And so we remained out there, and we finally got started in our training. And uh, they took us. We we were about 125 miles out northwest of Phoenix, Arizona. And uh, they would give us weekend passes, but we all went in groups of threes and fours. And he said, if one of you got caught out of that group, you'd be subject to a court martial. So we, I don't remember anybody ever getting caught out of it because they took it for granted that they meant business. And boy, we, we stayed out there. I don't know uh, where I mentioned this. This was a, a special light that was put in these tanks. Uh, it's been out and, and over with now, so I've, I have been able to mention it to any of where I've talked. And uh, it was what they called, you had a slot in the tank turret right in front right beside where the gun, you know, of 75 millimeter was. And uh, this slot was about two inches wide by maybe 20, 20 to 24 inches tall. And it was run off of a carbon arc type light. It reflected off of a mirror in the back of the turret out through this slot. And it would light up the countryside out here by a thousand yards forward. And you could put infantry boys in between the tanks. If you was going out here and say five tanks in a row, you'd have a shadow back there that nobody could see your infantry in it. And they could fire this light up out there and anybody out there within a thousand yards ahead, you could spot them and boy, you could mow them down. And boy, they thought this was gonna be ideal. But to find out after we got overseas that the ground, the terrain had to be so level, if it wasn't, you'd lose the effect of your light. If your tanks went down a hill in slope and, and the light was up here. So they never used it over there in any kind of a battle at all after uh, spending all that time on it. I see. So that being fact, was that flat? It had to be flat so terrain. In North Africa, it would, be, it would have been useful. That's, that was a point that we were tr supposedly trained for, but they beat them out, the Germans out of Africa before this all got laid out. In fact, Patton, Patton was sent out there to the desert to uh, uh, organize and make this camp out there to start with for that purpose. And so. Okay, and so how long did you train there? Oh, it was, uh, from uh, October. We got out there in October. We started training there by pretty quick. And uh, till uh, we moved back to Fort Knox in the uh, latter part of June. No, before that, before June, because the invasion of Normandy started on June the 6th. Mm -hmm. And therefore, we were sent there in, in Fort Knox when this happened. So therefore, I, uh, from uh, October of 43 until about last part of May, 1st of June of 44. And so at that time you were training with a crew in your tank, and I was wondering if you were, you, you stayed with them during all the war, maybe not all the war, but from the start of your training until you went overseas. Right. We were uh, same group in my tank was there until we went, got, actually, we went into battle. I went into battle with the same cr uh, crew that I started training with until uh, we had some injuries. But uh, and the replacements took the place of some of them. I see injuries, some of them got sick and had to, had to leave. And of course, put another, somebody else in his place. But I, once we got into battle, I, my crew stayed put just about it all the way through. 
And uh, so uh, we got acquainted with each other real well at that time. So. So in that crew, uh, you told me that most of the people, I mean every people, in fact, in the 740s were from Texas and Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. And uh, the people from your crew, they, they come from, they came from your area or they were like... Uh, you know, uh, some of the boys that was in my crew, I think most of them except me, were from Texas. I was the only Oklahoman in this tech particularly, but uh, you know this, it could be the other way around where the others were, uh, had most of their, were from uh, Oklahoma and have one or, or two Texans in their tank. Now some of the uh, officers that came to train us in Fort Knox, they, of course they were from different uh, states in the country. And uh, as uh, replacements came in, we wound up with a lot of other people from different countries, different countries, but different states. And, uh, but it didn't matter as long as we got, uh, got along and did things like that, we were happy to be with each other. We didn't care whether it was in Texas or Oklahoma. But any, uh, I tell you for sure, the old boy that was my gunner, not gunner, but l radio operator and loader, the of the big gun. He was about six foot three inches tall. He could stand up in the bottom of the tank and he'd be taking about this much out of the top of the <laughs> over the chair where he was. And uh, he said, Bradley, he says, I wish you'd get me a gun up here. I says, why? He says, I see things out there and by the time I tell you where I've seen them, they're hid. And if I got a gun up here, he says, I'm gonna kill somebody if I got sure they hide on me again. I I thought about that for a long time, but I never did get one uh, until we got into really battle over there one time. And this was a, when I got my Silver Star. I had got permission to install him a gun up there. And we were sent out that day to more or less scout because we were getting ready to make the final push. And uh, we run out to a little old village there and the people run out just cheering. They just left, they just left. I said, who? The Germans. We kept going, we got clear out of radio contact and we found them. They had dug themselves in up there and Lieutenant, had a tank with nine boys on it, and I had a tank with nine boys, nine infantry boys. And they hit his tank, the lieutenant's tank, knocked it out through the front of his tank, hit his assistant driver, bo lost both legs at the same time. It knocked the tank out, he wasn't operable. They got out, everybody got out. Even that man that lost his legs, he was the first man out of that tank. So I pulled my tank around. And I told my gunners, I said, go start firing. Well, the, the gunner, the uh, boy that operates the big gun, the 75, his 30 caliber was jammed on him. And the gunner, the assistant driver's gun, he has a 30 caliber, it jammed on him. And I wouldn't fire the big gun because we was under this woody dairy, afraid it would, shrapnel and stuff would explode around and kill some of our own men. So this boy, I installed his gun up there, he opened up with that 30 caliber up on top. He fired every box of ammunition we had in that tank and he kept them all pinned down. And we never lost another man, not everyone got injured and we beat them down. I don't know how many he hit. I didn't, we didn't stay long enough to check. But anyway, for that action, he and I both was recommended for the Silver Star and, and got it. People say, you're, you're, you're a hero. I said, no, heroes, everybody that's fighting out there probably, but says, you're not a, a hero in my opinion. You fight and try to protect the rest of the men you got there and hope that everything goes in favor of you. Otherwise, you wouldn't be up here to start with. So we made it through that pretty good. And 
it wasn't too long after that that the war ended. You just mentioned that the other tank, you know, was not out. But was, was it like a, a, a German tanks or Panzer Shrek, Panzer Faust? Who, I mean, was it a tank who not out the other tank? Uh, no, it was just a, a bunch of infantry boys that dug in with an anti-tank gun out there, and that, that hit our tank there and knocked it out for them. We didn't see any more tanks around there at all. I'm going to back up a little bit. Um, so, you, you mentioned the fact that you went overseas uh, after the invasion of Normandy, mm -hmm. but when did you arrive in France and where? Well, it was uh, basically we crossed the English Channel, uh, oh, let's see, it was about September, something like the last part of August or September, and uh, you know, it's getting close to October because we wound up up there uh, at uh, New Chateau, Belgium, uh, in October, camped out in an uh, apple orchard. And brother, I tell you, it was getting cold in. And uh, we had uh, uh, the German V V uh, V one or those uh, V2, yeah, flying over us. Well, that's our first act, uh, first part that we understood while we were sitting in combat, just about it. They was flying over us every night, that every, every hour on the hour that night. And uh, I don't know where they was aiming at us or where they was aiming at uh, Liege or some a port over that way. But anyway, if we had one or two that uh, dove and come down within hearing distance of the doggone thing. And some of the civilians were injured, uh, or medic people had to, had to treat them for it. But it, I don't, I don't recognize, recognize that anybody else was killed at that time. But anyway, that was our first part of visualizing we were near combat. But that was the loudest and most horrible sound coming over you ever seen. And they said, that, you know, once that motor cut out, you never know where the thing was coming down. And they were right, boy. You never knew it. Yeah, the Germans, they were pretty, like, it was traumatic with the sound of, you know, the planes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Also, the V1 and V2, it's like the, I don't know how they call it, but, like, it was like a B. Yeah. It's a, <laughs> but I tell you, boy, I just, I'm glad we didn't have to fight face them things very long at all. It didn't take long after that that they, uh, I guess the bombers and stuff got got rid of the production of them pretty quick. And so Harold, uh, you mentioned Aachen, Germany. And um, wh when did you go to Aachen? Because I I guess you, you drove south after? No, we did, uh, our outfit never did go into Aachen. We went north of Aachen, you know, okay. yeah, and uh, up through that way, and uh, I can't remember who it was that came in on on the other deal, but we went directly in to combat, and they sent us to Spearmont to draw ordnance depot there to try to get tanks, and once once we got what we could make work, we went into battle with the uh, 30th. 30th Infantry Division, I think it was. And uh, uh, we met Hitler's Piper, his big armored band. Hitler picked him especially for this drive in that breakthrough in Belgium. And once we got in there and started f fighting at Stumont, that's where we met him. And we never stopped. We turned him around and forced him to take what he had left. And last time we seen or heard of him, it was at Lise, Belgium. And uh, 
there was reports said he thought that the whole division had come down on his outfit there at like Glees. And uh, but anyway, this elderly gentleman I was talking about, he his tank was the first tank from our div uh, battalion to, to arrive at Lagleese. And uh, so that was the last time we heard of Piper and he was heading back to Germany. We never saw him again. But we relieved one tank battalion that was getting beat. And they was on they was retreating when we met up and took over their job. Third tank, you know, we're still we're still in Laglaise, you know, the, the German tank. Yeah. Is your battalion who not out that German tank? Do what? Is it your battalion who not out that German tank? Uh huh. Uh huh. Wow. And uh, I didn't know uh, a lot about this little church there at Laglaise until we went back in 2014. And uh, this elderly gentleman that's been around there for years, he kind of uh, led us through what all took place there at that little church. It had been out, uh, Germans had, had uh, or more or less destroyed it until they recently rebuilt it, you know. But anyway, he was telling us all about uh, how they all survived that deal there and the other. But uh, it was quite interesting the last time we visited there. You see that? And uh, so they've re redone their museum there too from what the last time, the first time we went by there. And uh, uh, they, they presented each one of the veterans a, a cap with a battle of the bulls across the top of it. I One more hot for you. Yep, that's right. So, uh, but anyway. Okay. And, um, you told us that, you know, there were like some people like at the end of the war were, you know, knocking out with like, you know, bazooka and, you know. But have you ever like met any other tanks but German tanks like Tiger or Panzer or? Not, uh, not uh, afterwards, you know, other than the, what few we run into there at uh, Stubont. We met uh, two or three Tigers there and uh, the Panzer too. And uh, this uh, narrow road going into there, it was kind of uphill still. And it ice and stuff was beginning to form all over the roads. And boy, I'll tell you for sure, we had our, our com company commander, he ordered to cut tr trees, limbs, and lay across the road where the tanks would, would have some grip on coming up that slope in, into, into Stubont. And uh, this uh, building that we had got damaged real bad. Uh, it was, uh, had a lot of young kids and even some American prisoners and Germans were down in the basement of this thing during all that bombing and firing on this building that survived the whole works. And we've been back a couple of times to this place and uh, it was it's amazing that they've rebuilt the portion that was just more or le less blown away. And uh, the last time we were there, they presented each one of the veterans with a certificate of, of their participation in, in their part of that battle there. And uh, we've met, I met so many people there that I never, uh, one or two ladies that were kids, were young k kids, when this all happened, but they were still living around there and was able to visit with us as adults. Wow. It's, it's a, I just, I just can't get over the people and the many people that I've visited with over there and, and uh, has become friends with me just like you have, I guess, through Facebook. It's great. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm glad. I'm very happy for that. Yeah. Harold, um, I met one time a guy who was a 
gunner in the tank and he told me about the condition you know sometimes and I was just wondering if you could tell me with details the life condition when you are in the tank so where did you sleep where did you eat where did you wash if you could wash sometimes you know well when we did have a chance to to stop the only place we had to sleep was in that tank there was no way uh, uh, we had what clothes we had on our backs and maybe a blanket or two but then that's all we'd have for uh, sleep in there and each we had nothing but what we call sea rations just little cans of, of maybe uh, some kind of scrambled egg for breakfast or some kind of soft stuff for lunch and until we got to the point where we might be able to stop for a day or a few hours, then we might give a chance to wash our face, and if our beards were growing, maybe shave them. But most of the time, we just we didn't do that until we got to the point where we were relieved of of that accident and, and pulled back for a several days, which that very seldom didn't happen. Because once we got into Germany, there we were on the go day and night. And we got to the point after we crossed the Ruhr River, heading for the Rhine, that uh, we met a lot of Germans that was get, uh, firing their weapons, whether they were shooting at us or just getting rid of the ammunition and giving up. And uh, i tell you how I got my Purple Heart right during this time. Uh, we were going up through there, and there's a horse-drawn vehicle pulling the, some kind of a gun or something on the back, back of the vehicle. And uh, I told my gunner, I said, bring the gun around here and fire some 30 caliber ammunition, and maybe he'll turn and come to us. Well, instead of that, he turned and went away from us. I said, fire some at him. I don't know whether he got on the wrong celadoid or the 75 or the 30 caliber, but he hit the 75. And he blew that horse, that man, sky high. And I had my hand set on the recoil of that cover of that 75. When he fired that thing, my <clears throat> come back and just crushed that hand. Same hand that I got that finger broke. I pulled over and called for a medic. And I was sitting down <laughs> there in front of this old bunker in the shade. I was sicker than a horse. And all of a sudden, here come five German SS troopers out of that bunker. Still had their guns on them. They never attempted to fire around. They give their guns up. We turned them and said, march that away to the ring. And they hid. Now, I don't know where they had had all the fighting they wanted or what, but they give up to us. The medic come, dressed my hand. He said, get back in that tank, Bradley. You're not hurt bad enough. Stop. He bandaged it up, and I went back in the tank. Here we went. And we hadn't gone too many more miles that, uh, during that area. We got orders that our tank battalion had been ordered to pull out of the northern front and travel by train. Uh, we had to go back to Aachen, Germany, put our tanks on a flat car, and everybody in a tanker would ride the car ahead of it and travel to the Seventh Army front down on the southern France. We were down there for about two weeks, they sent us back up there, and we was almost ready to cross the Rhine River. You know, yeah. Your aunt, so did you break bones? No, it just cut. It just cut this thumb and uh, right in here, it was all cut and bleeding. It's okay. Injury. That's when I got the purple heart. Okay. But so when those SS 75s 
say, say one out, you know, to surrender. I, I would imagine that many SS, they were like, you know, they were fanatic. Yeah, like that's right. Those guys, how old, do you know if they were young or like older than you? Uh, I think most of them was older than me. But it got to the point that there in, in that Battle of the Bulls, they were bringing up 16-year-old kids on the front lines. But I didn't ever, uh, now I heard this, I didn't see it, I heard that. And, uh, but uh, as far as seeing a lot of them, uh, all I've seen is German prisoners, they look, they look manly as if they were uh, a lot older than me. So uh, I tell you, it got to the point where so many prisoners giving up, it got to the point where you just couldn't hardly get your tank down the road because it, they, were so many prisoners coming down the road, giving up, giving up to us rather than the Russians. And um, I met a few guys, you know, the, they've got bad experience with SS, mm -hmm. and uh, they didn't want to take any prisoners mm -hmm. anymore, like any SS. Did you have like something special with the SS, or you just treat them like the others? Mm -hmm. I, we just treated them just like any other prisoner. By gosh, if they give up to us, we didn't we didn't, didn't fuss about it. Now I've seen or heard some where they take them over the hill, a few of them over the hill, and that was never came back. So I don't know how many there people that that they killed or or what, but they were left for them going this that, and the other. So, but I didn't have that deal, you know, and uh, so it was, I guess I'm just lucky that I've survived the whole mess as much as I did. Do you remember when you were wounded, like the months? Uh, it was more or less in uh, April, April, it seemed like it was April. Right. Uh -huh. That's why yeah. That's right. This, and uh, but uh, I don't know how true it was. I was talking about that light a while ago. You know, mm -hmm. uh, someone said at one time some outfit that trained out there in the desert used that light on the Rhine River when the Germans was floating mines or something down the river trying to blow up that last uh, bridge at Rigmaga. They said they used that then, but I I could I couldn't verify that at all, uh, Flo, because I, that was just come by mouth, you know. Yeah. If it did, that was the only time it's ever used in combat. <laughs> okay. But I I could see why it would be beneficial with that much light that they could give on on the water if they could see something floating down the river in it, and maybe they could uh, shoot it out before it hit a target. I think it was pretty new, mm -hmm. right? But oh, I, yeah. I don't really know if they've used it. Uh, I'm gonna check on it. Yeah. Okay. And um, so we are in April '45. You're in Germany. Yep. Yeah. And uh, I don't mean like you know movies are history, but sometimes it's interesting to see movies, you know, to maybe understand more. And have you, have you ever watched Fury? You know the movie. And. Uh, we can see like soldiers in the tank the end of the war they're very tired they're still German but you know like pockets of Germans and some local that you try to find if they're like Nazi or like mm -hmm. local I mean you're in the enemy territory how, how it was how was it to be in the enemy territory uh, you know I found that movie, of course, you got to realize it's a movie. Yeah. That was so far out of what we went through that I wouldn't recommend it for anybody. I wouldn't, I wouldn't, especially young people. The vulgar language that they use in that tank crew is nothing like that went through ours. I mean, nothing. And the way they treated that recruit, 
to replace somebody in that tank was outlandish. They used that boy like he was a dummy on everything he tried to learn from them. And they didn't take time to learn it. To he had to learn it all by himself. And he wound up saving just about the whole bunch, uh, uh, warning them that the Germans were coming here and there and this, that, and the other. Man, though, I wouldn't, I wouldn't treat one of my crew members a dog as bad as they treated that boy. Now, I'm not, that's just my opinion. And I have to realize that it's only a movie, but it was not near as true to farm as Saving Private Ryan. And uh, therefore, I, I just wouldn't recommend anybody see it if they, if they uh, had the chance to back out of it or not. So, and I told some of them on the email and stuff like that what I thought about it too. I don't know whether they appreciated it or not, but I did. So what? What do you mean? It's like about the replacement. And so, did you have like replacement in your crew? I, in combat, I didn't ever have a replacement in my crew. Once we went into combat, uh, my my all five of us stayed put. I never had a tank knocked out from under me. Got some close, got close at a time or two. And because uh, I, I was fortunate enough, I had a good tank commander, not the tank commander, but a leader, Lieutenant Powers was his name. And oh, this Loopy that had this uh, 90 millimeter and a tank gun. That son of a gun wasn't afraid of nothing. And if he was re willing, and he, uh, he was more than willing to take the lead on anything and every day if he had to be. And Lieutenant Powers was the same way. They both were brave son of a guns. And uh, I would trust them if every day. But now, this Loopy had his 90 millimeter gun. He was the sorriest cotton picking soldier you'll ever see in, in the States. You give him a pass on a weekend, nine times out of 10, he wouldn't be back there for Reveille on Monday morning. But he was a good soldier in battle, and he continued to be that way. And he he come back too, and he uh, he made a battlefield commission from a staff sergeant to lieutenant before his, before the battle was over with. And uh, so uh, there's an old boy that called me one time from New York, and uh, I was outside taking down my Christmas decorations. And my wife says, there's a guy from New York want to talk to you. So I run in here. He told me who he was. He says, I want to ask you a few questions about uh, Battle of World War II War. I said, okay. I guess maybe we talked for 30 minutes on the phone. He asked me about, did I know Lupin? Did I know Powers? I told him just exactly what I told you. He said, I sure do thank you. I got him, he, he wrote a book, used my name in it, by gosh, <laughs> talking to him about it. And uh, so he's still living up around New York somewhere, I don't know for sure. When was it? A few years ago? Well, yeah, it was a few years ago. It was after I moved down here. Uh, oh, I, I want to say it was probably in it was before 2004 because my wife was still living then. And uh, I guess around 2000, something like that. Harold, um, when you were in Germany, did you like talk with local people? Did you stop and how was the relation? I mean, not a relation, but how was it with the the Germans. Well, the uh, most of the Germans uh, that I came in contact with after during the, you know, after uh, going through certain sounds, they were they were glad that the war was over with, and uh, there was you know a lot of I couldn't carry on a conversation because they could I couldn't speak German and and they couldn't speak English, but they seemed to me as to be happy that they were through with the Nazi part of the of the war, and. Uh, because 
once we were drove into a place, if the civilians were still around, they were they were clapping their arms up in the air, and glad that we got there. But uh, uh, as far as carrying on a conversation with any of them, I, I didn't ever carry any conversation with them. I just I'm just trying to read their mind the way they act acted that they were happy that it was all over with and happy to see us bring it to a close. And you know in April forty five your your president Roosevelt who died. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I was just wondering because it seems that some people were very affected by that news. Yeah. Some people just didn't care. And I mean when you are like in combat and your president died, what what, what does it mean? I mean Well I think a lot of the majority of it was the uh they had they were happy that he had done what he did, but still, on the other hand, they were sorry to see him go. But we, as a whole, uh, we felt like we couldn't let that, even though we thought that much of him, we couldn't let that affect our way of thinking of what we had to go and try to finish. And uh, <coughs> and Mr. Harry Truman come in there and took his place and now our thoughts at first I don't know where Harry has has the ability to do what he did or do you know to replace Roosevelt but it turned out that he probably c helped end the war quicker than uh, Roosevelt would have before he was so uh, I'm sure that what he did in Judge Payne he he saved a lot of people's lives by doing what he did. And of course, he killed a lot of people with that, those two bombs, too. But war is hell. And today, I don't agree with what we're facing today. They say we're in war with Afghanistan. The war was in Iraq. We didn't finish either one of those wars and haven't finished either one of those wars. We're in politics here. Politics has taken over the fighting of a war. If you're going to go into a war, I believe that you go in there to win it, not by talk, but by action. And uh, therefore, I just can't see spending all the money that the United States has spent, and they're still killing people in both places. And our president is taken down to nothing. Now, I don't know what his, I think I know what his idea is, but I'm, I'll probably speak out of turn. Because I don't think he has any idea what, uh, maybe he does. Maybe he knows what he's doing. Because he's pulling, he is really robbing the military cutting back on this and cutting back on that. And the first thing you know, our military is going to be the sh smallest it has ever been. And it was pretty small when World War II happened. Yeah, it was nothing. Mm -mm, nothing. And we were lucky to have people that would jump in and start doing what they did to build our military strength up with this and with that. that yeah. It paid off. Harold went. Do you remember where you were when the war ended in Europe? Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Could you tell me more about that day for you? How uh, was it? Well, uh, we were had had pushed all the way to the Baltic Sea. North. Right. And we met the Russians there. And we didn't know exactly, you know, how we would get along. Well. We found out that the war had de was declared over, and my gosh, the celebration by the Russians firing all their signal flares in the air, and this, that, and the other. We were out there at that big lake at, uh, uh, the name of that city, I lost my what, James Thought right then, but anyway, we were 
sitting there in this uh, airport there, and they was planes was trying to take off and take off, and, <laughs> and we used them as target practice by <laughs> getting shutting them down. But anyway, uh, it was several days before we actually heard uh, through Britain. British had announced that the war was over, and we were uh, worried about this and worried about that. And and uh, first thing we know, we had seen the they seen that the United States was celebrating, and here we was, didn't hardly even know what it was all about. But anyway, we finally got word it was over with, and, and we, then we started worrying about when we were going to get to go home and how long that would be and whether we, we'd like to be uh, occupation up there in, uh, in the north, up there near the Baltic Sea. You wanted to stay there? Huh? Yeah, oh. but the Russians had a little say into that, so they took over that part of it. So we uh, were sent back down to, uh, oh, uh, Lost my train again, but anyway, it's uh, back down near Kassel, Germany. That's where we doing our uh, occupation duty there, right near Russia's on one side over there, and we the United States, was, British was on the other side of that occupation line, growing up there. So we wound up there, and uh, I found up wound up. Uh, having enough points. They started this point system. You get so many points if you were married, you get so many points if you had any kids, you had so many points for uh, overseas duty, and so many points you'd get for uh, awards like the Silver Star, the Purple Heart, and Battles you'd been in. I had enough points that they said, get ready, you're going to go home. Well, my gosh, I kept there. They set up this place at uh, their occupation here. We do some sports activity, training, baseball, and playing baseball, and this, that, and the other. And uh, some of us had some of the guard duty, you know, all around, making sure everything was okay, but it stayed quiet. But anyway, I finally got my order says, well, you're going you go to be heading to the port. But my gosh, it, it was uh, Thanksgiving Day when I took off from Port, uh, at the port France at La Havre, heading back to the United States, and I had Thanksgiving dinner on a on a ship. Got sick and couldn't eat, but I got back to New York. Started processing out in in December. I got home and had Chris had Christmas dinner with my family, and enjoyed that year for Christmas Day. I would love to know. You know. You spent a few years in the army, mm -hmm. and you were overseas for more than a year. That's right. How was it? I, I just tell me with the word. How was it to be back home? Just how, could you tell me more about that day? Well, I tell you for sure. Uh, once I got got my discharge papers, and they said you here is uh, I think it's fourteen dollars or something. So this this will buy you a bus ticket from Arkansas to Paul's Valley, Oklahoma, and brother, they had it figured right down <laughs> to the T. And but I was happy to be on my way home, and I got I got into Paul's Valley, Oklahoma. That's where my wife was was from. I got in there about midnight, and I was so happy. I took a taxi out to. Uh, out to her house, and I tell you what, I was so thrilled and happy to be my feet on the ground again in, in good old USA that I couldn't hardly s sleep that rest of that night. But I tell you what, it was, it seemed like a burden had left my whole soul because she had uh, worked and waited all these years the time I left her standing on the depot in Fort Knox on July 
until I got home in December 45. I feel like God Almighty had taken care of me and her both all these years I was gone. And, uh, but anyway, this was something that, I'd like to add one more thing in here. I, go, I have to go back and do it, but when we was at Fort Knox, uh, we were out there on the firing line. The old Colonel, he didn't believe sitting on our butts. He believed in keeping us active with that gun shooting. He says, if you learn to shoot what you're looking at, you'll survive this war. So we, we were firing. We had to load up. I'd go out on a, on a truck, GI truck over rough terrain, mark a target, come back and take instructions. Well, this time we went out there, marked the targets. This one old boy, no better, picked up a 37 millimeter dud, stuck it in his pocket, rode this old GI truck all back across that rough terrain, wondered if it had to go on off on that. But once we got back there, he sat down there and pecked it in the ground while he was taking instructions. Boom! That son of a gun went off. It blew both of his legs off, both arms. I was sitting an arm's distance of him with his back to me. A piece of shrapnel, this poor old hand caught him. A piece of shrapnel cut me on the thumb from that explosion. Three men got killed. Nineteen of us went to the hospital. And one of those men that was killed was one of my good buddies from my home uh, where I lived and worked in Paul's Valley, he and his wife got married the same week that w I got married. A piece of shrapnel cut his juggle vein and he was dead before he got him on a stretcher. So, uh, and that happened the same day that they made the invasion of Normandy. And that's, I tell you for sure, that's, that is something that back in the States you have to, have to go through something like that. And then you better to do it, but, but he didn't. But anyway, my wife had come down to Fort Knox because we had extra time down there. And we, we rented a little old place out there at, near the on the uh, near the Ohio River, and uh, she got a job out to the hospital on the base, and we'd go out there and have breakfast and lunch out there on the base, and uh, she got to working with the nurses. This one nurse was a colonel, and she. They told her, told my wife, I said, she can't. They can't please her how to fix her lunch or this, that, and the other. Kathy said, well, why? She said, well, I don't know. She's hard to fix. She said, well, I'll ask her. I'll talk to her. And uh, so she went to her and said, now listen, they tell me you're hard to please. You tell me how you want it, I'll fix it for you that way. Well, she did, and she made a friend out of that nurse. But anyway, get back to this. They had heard that this explosion had taken place down there, and my wife was went to the hospital, and she's heading for the emergency room. The little lieutenant stopped her. said, you can't go down there. She said, my husband may be wounded. He said, I don't care. You can't go in there. About this time, here come this colonel nurse. What's the matter, Kathleen? She said, this lieutenant won't let, me, won't let me come in there. She said, lieutenant, move aside. He stepped aside. She come down there. Sure enough, I was wounded. And this colonel nurse gave me a tetanus shot. Guess where she gave it to me at? Not in the bohine, between the ribs. I never had a shot hurt any worse in my life. I says, why there, Colonel? She says, it'll take effect quicker. I said, it hurts a lot quicker, too. <laughs> but anyway, that was a story there. I just, I will never forget that as long as I live. You mentioned a lot about your wife, but I didn't know, in fact, that you were married 
before you were attracted? Or? No. I, I got married on my uh, second uh, furlough from the desert. On March the 29, 1944, we got married, and uh, so uh, we were married 58 years the day that sh she died. And uh, Lord, I tell you, that took me for a loop. But anyway, I've, uh, we had two children. The daughter lives here. and. A son. He he was in uh, Vietnam War. He was in a, he was a jet aircraft maintenance, and he spent about fourteen months in Thailand during the Vietnam War. And uh, he had charge of planes that would fly into Thailand from Thailand into Vietnam and bomb them. And uh, but he he. Put up four years in the Air Force, came home. They gave him a clean bill of health. He got married, and uh, he was working for a cable television tower in Austin, Texas. And uh, he moved from there over to Fredericksburg, Texas, still with the same kind of work. And he started having some heart problems. After spending four years in the Air Force, he started having some heart problems, and the doctor said, you've got to quit climbing those towers. So he quit over there, went back to Austin, and went to work at a power and light company all on the ground floor, and started going to school at night. And uh, they had their first child, and uh, then they, three years later, they had a second child. He was still hanging in there. And all of a sudden, he got a call on a Sunday morning from this old boy at Fredericksburg. He said, Philip says, can you come over here and give us some advice? We've been off the air after a thunderstorm, and we can't seem to get back on the air. He jumped in his car, drove clear over to Fredericksburg, and instead of trying to tell him what he thought was wrong with it, he proceeded to climb what they call a hot tower. Couldn't, he had to jump on the tower, then climb, and get hooked in. He got almost to the top. He fell almost 200 feet to his death. Lord, and that happened on his sister's birthday. I don't know how I got good, good sense anymore, horse. After my wife went down with this rheumatoid arthritis, in 1985 she had her first joint replacements. Thumbs. These were so bad that this fused them where she could hold a glass or a cup of water and coffee. And her feet was operated on at the same time as the hands. So uh, I knew he was facing some more surgeries, so I just made up my mind to retire at night in 86. And from then on, she had both hips operated on, replaced both hips, one at a time, both shoulders, one at a time, both knees at the same time with rheumatoid arthritis. Then winds up falling, hurting her back, and she couldn't, couldn't do, even get hardly out of a wheelchair. And she says, all we can do is just give her pain message she spent over a month in the hospital at Methodist Hospital in Houston. They finally got her a room out here at Webster's at a skilled nursing center. Moved her out there and she lived nine days and died with pneumonia in 2002. After all that surgery, the pneumonia got her. So I had more women to take care of during my lifetime than anyone did. <laughs> so it's like I said, my mother never learned to drive out there, so I had to take care of her. And his wife was down parts of the time out there that she couldn't drive. And 
she had an aunt. My mother, uh, sister, was having to t I was having to help ha take care of her. So I don't know. It's <laughs> and my wife's mother lived to be a hundred years old. And never had a, anything wrong with her until she fell out the front yard of the house one day, went out to pick up a newspaper, and she tripped over a hose that she drug out there to water her flowers, broke both wrists at the same time. So I'm thanking the Lord that I'm still around. And you were still good for hmm? anyone? Yeah. Thanks for sharing that. Well, well you know, you, you don't have to use any of it if you don't want to, but I know you will. <laughs> but anyway, I'm happy that I can tell you what I do. And Harold, um, I was wondering, you know, you're, you're 91 and you, you, you went through a lot of things, good thing, enjoyable thing, mm -hmm. but also very difficult and painful thing and uh, I was wondering if you would talk to your like to someone of my generation or you know maybe your grandchildren generation um, would you like would you have something to tell them like like a piece of advice to maybe try to have a good life well I have found now this out now when I returned I told my wife then, I said, now I'm not, I'm not going to sit down and hold my hands because once you sit down and do nothing, you're giving your life up right quick. So my advice to any young person is to don't sit down, do what you feel like you could do, enjoy life, and uh, enjoy having the privilege that we've all had before you and do that with all your kids and passing this this information down to them I have found that it has been a pleasure for me to see my great grandkids not many people can say their great grandkids they see them now I told you mother I've got nine great grandkids seven boys and two great-granddaughters. Now my great-granddaughters is living near here and one of them is over here that had her mother, uh, her grandmother just went and got her and she she comes over here and, and butters her grandmother up to stay with us over the weekend at times you know. But anyway she's ten right now and her sister is uh, 15 so uh, they've been in they've been in the Navy nuclear powered submarines for 16 years he got out a couple of years ago their daddy did so by uh, they're being real close now I'm enjoying their their company real so pleasure to see them and this little young, this, she is so lovable and sharp as a tack and uh, it's it's just a pleasure to be still around, see them grow up. Now my grandsons are a little further apart right now, and great grandkids, but uh, my oldest grandson, their daddy that got killed, he was only five when his daddy got killed, and uh, he lives over here in Georgia right now. He's in the Navy, and he's being transferred to out in Washington, state of Washington. He's going to be uh, on uh, the ship Nimitz, the aircraft carrier Nimitz, for his next tour of duty. And he, they got, he's got two boys. And his brother that was three when his daddy got killed, he's got three boys. And, and my daughter's boy, uh, Philip Goodwin, he's got two boys. And his oldest boy had to go through cancer couple of years ago had to remove one of his kidneys but he's doing okay now. he got his last checkup they couldn't find no signs of so he's happy-go-lucky but 
any advice that I've given, at, and the thing about it is uh, most of my grandkids had a chance to come out and, and play and visit the farm when I was uh, working back and forth. And they will not never forget what they learned out there on the farm. Things that they've seen out there that they'll never forget. So I feel like, you know, seeing me and doing what I've done and tell them a few things here and there is, it will benefit them down the road. Oh, yeah. That's for sure. <laughs> and Harold, I was wondering, um, you know, we, we've got the project of creating a museum, you know, because for me, your stories are very important because if we're free today, it's thanks to you and your generation. And it makes me very sad sometimes when I see people who don't know anything about that. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's only 70 years ago. And uh, do you think it's important to remember and why? Oh, man, that is, in my generation, that is so important for anyone your family or anybody else's family, that they need to know and see stuff like this. Because once they're gone and in their grave, their stories are dead unless people like you are, are bringing this up to put it in museums where people down the road 70 or 100 years from now can see it and enjoy what went on 75 years ago or so. So I said, Power to you, son. Do everything you can, and and I'm sure the memories of that will pay off for you in the long run. Thank you, Harold. Thank God we have the freedom today that you can do that. Yeah, you because right. years ago, they wouldn't have let you do it. That's true. Because every time I hear from somebody from Belgium, the Netherlands, over there, they're thanking me for the freedom they're enjoying today. We, we yeah, you, we don't, we don't forget, you know. That's right. Yeah. I tell you, one of the best trips that I've enjoyed more so is the, the year 2014 when we went back over there for the 70th anniversary. Of course, it was in May before the anniversary was in December, actually, but in May. We got to go uh, to Henry Chappelle Cemetery on Memorial Day, and also to the Mart, Mart Garden in the Netherlands, mm -hmm. that big cemetery, that military cemetery, American military cemetery there, and to see the people that had gathered up around those cemeteries to honor our action that gave them their freedom that they could do it. The one in Belgium, guess who was there? The king's representatives. He had a whole tr troop that come in there and marched in there and talked, one or two of them talked on the, about it. And at the end, of course, we all respected their entryway Nothing was said or done until they got it seated. And the same thing was never done when they got up to march out. But in the process, that representative came over to each one of us veterans that were sitting there and shook my hand and tell me, told us what he was so proud to be able to thank us for the freedom that they all enjoy today. And I don't know, I, I want to estimate there's probably between five and 700 people there that day. We went from there over to the one in the Netherlands. And there's over 10,000 veterans buried in that cemetery. And by People were gathered around, standing in three and four deep around the whole area where the 
a celebration was going on. I bet there was 2,000 people there just to watch it and enjoying the celebration of honoring all those soldiers. And that just, that just got me to the point that I said, Lord, thank God I'm here to see this. Because I don't see that much of it in the United States. Smaller groups, you know, private groups, they get how that was deal. But, you know, as far as gathering something like that, I got, I, I got into uh, Facebook, uh, not Facebook, but scrapping scrapbooking in there. I got some pictures of, of the Lynn there, of the one at Henry Chappelle. I would love to see that after, after, yeah. Okay. But, you know, I think through my trip in the United States and my years in, the, in France, I've seen a big difference between your country and my country, but in the United States, a lot of people recognize the veterans you know, like our veterans, the United States veterans, but they don't really ask. They just say, thanks for your service. Mm -hmm. But they don't say, where did you serve? That's or right. what did you do? That's right. Yeah. But in France, we don't recognize a lot of our veterans, mm -hmm. but we really recognize the people who gave us our freedom. That's right. That's right. So I would say that, I don't know if the word is correct, but... We don't have a lot of people who are like pro-military, mm -hmm. but they just enjoy talking to you and to all your generation because there is sense. That's right. It's not just, you know. That's right. And uh, that, that's very, that's something, this you is know, a big difference. That's why, you know, uh, that's why uh, I don't understand why a lot of them don't, uh, is not willing to, I'm talking about veterans now, mm -hmm. is not willing to visit with people like you talk to people like you but you know uh, I had two two young men uh, now come to one of our reunions one time and their daddy was in the same company with me and they said Mr. Bradley would you tell us what you and our daddy did over there I said I'd be happy he says Daddy never told us one thing. He never told Mother one thing. After he come back, he never said nothing about the war. And the young boy, the youngest boy, he was only five when his daddy died after he come back. He says, Daddy never told Mother nothing. He says, would you be willing to t sit down and talk to me? I said, sure. I went out and got a tape recorder. That's where it had to... Uh, fancy stuff and that next day he come in and I sat down and I talked with him over two hours he recorded everything that we said he says now Mr. Brady thank you he says I'm going to go home now and, tell, and let mama listen to what daddy did with you now those young men were suffering for something their daddy kept to himself I got three kids right down the street here. Excuse me. Down the street here. One of them just graduated from Texas A&M in the A&M Corps, Army Corps. He was my first. His mother asked me, he says, Mr. Bradley, said, could you tell me something? I said, yeah. She says, I'm not trying to find out how old you are, but she said, would you tell me, did you serve in World War II or, or, and go through the de depression? I said, I can qualify for both of them. She said, good. She says, my son has got a history lesson and he's got to interview somebody that did that. I said, well, just let him come down and I'll talk with him. So about a week later, he come down. I set up a time. He come right in here and we talk. He had his questions all written down. He had a paper where I had to sign it saying he had interviewed me. I did that. We talked maybe an hour. Next day I saw his daddy. His daddy's going to work. He stops and says, Harold, he says, I want to thank you. I said, what for? He says, I want to thank you for what you and 
my boy did. He says, I've never seen a boy so enthused after he talking to you. He says, thank you. You know, and that come around, and the next boy come around, and I had to do him. He was a middle boy, but he didn't have his questions made out. And said, uh, in fact, he had to go back and get his paper I was supposed to sign. He was altogether different, the two boys. But anyway, we, I interviewed, he interviewed me. Then the girl came out. She just graduated from high school this past May. She was a valedictorian of her senior class. And she's got a full scholarship paid to Texas A&M. And she is, she thanked me so much every time I see her about what I told her about the boy. So now I got an appointment on March the 4th I've been called and asked if I would talk to a senior class about World War II. And this is the first time, I don't, I think this is a private school, because they're, ta they're, t they're talking about the Battle of the Bulls in World War II. 